so I, I want to start tonight by talking a little bit about why I decided to go to Iraq. But before I, I, I get there, I want to read uh, a recent quote uh, from former CENTCOM Commander General John Abizade. He recently gave a talk at Stanford University. Um, many of you probably heard this headline on Democracy Now! this past week. And uh, the former CENTCOM Commander General said, uh, when speaking about the Iraq War, quote, of course it's about oil, we can't really deny that. He then went on to say, quote, we've treated the Arab world as a collection of big gas stations. Our message to them is, guys, keep your pumps open, prices low, be nice to the Israelis, and you can do whatever you want out back. Of course, this comment comes uh, about a month after former Federal Reserve Chair Alan Greenspan wrote that, quote, the Iraq War is largely about oil. So here we are, um, starting to approach the fifth year of the occupation. And this information is coming out, uh, sometimes even being broadcast in the mainstream corporate media. And where was that reportage nearly five years ago when the drums for war against Iraq started to be beaten? And so I want to go back to that time frame to, to use some of that information to, to show why I decided to go over to Iraq. And I want to start with September 6, 2002. It was on that date that former White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card said of the PR campaign for the Iraq War, quote, from a marketing point of view, you don't introduce new products in August. I didn't hear any mainstream media outlets being critical of the fact that a White House Chief of Staff was mentioning war and a PR campaign in the same sentence. And then on the very next day, September 7, 2002, George Bush and Tony Blair stood together at Camp David and declared that evidence from a report published by the UN International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, showed that Iraq was, quote, six months away, in quotes, from building nuclear weapons. What made this outrageous was the fact that no such IAEA report ever existed. And again, where was the mainstream corporate media in being critical of that and pointing out this fact, which I knew at the time, people like Scott Ritter were talking about it, many of you probably already knew it at that time as well, but nevertheless we had a corporate media that was continuing to broadcast information about nuclear weapons or WMDs or 9-11. The very next day, September 8, 2002, the New York Times ran a front page piece co-authored by Judith Miller of WMD Notoriety and Michael Gordon of the same, in which they proudly quoted an anonymous, quote, Bush administration official as saying, Iraq has stepped up its quest for nuclear weapons and has embarked on a worldwide hunt for materials to make an atomic bomb. That anger that I still feel every time I read those quotes and remind myself of these events that took place that helped make this war and occupation possible, that rage because of the injustice, because of that hunger for justice that feeling is exactly why I went to Iraq. I had more rage than I had fear, and I definitely had fear. But I was, I was sickened, I was completely outraged at what the media was doing to make this possible. And I believe that if the media, if the corporate media were really acting as journalists, I would argue that this war and occupation would never have taken place. But that's why I decided to go, once because, because once the invasion was launched and the corporate media coverage of that was arguably as bad or even worse than uh, the, the, the build-up to it. You know, if we watched uh, corporate media, the television, the CNNs, the Fox so-called news outlet, the ABC, NBC, CBS, all of them, it was like weapon, watching man, weapons manufacturing shows, 
um, flags waving, rah, rah, the war. Uh, we were not seeing war. We were not seeing what happened when bombs exploded on human beings. Uh, we were not seeing the suffering. And then the coverage, of course, of the occupation was just as bad with the, the staged toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein pulled down by an American tank, uh, at least half of the so-called Iraqis there dancing around it, um, members of, uh, of uh, Ahmed Chalabi's private militia, uh, none of this information, of course, being broadcast in the corporate media. And so I decided to go in for, for those reasons and uh, started to report uh, as Maureen said, I basically used the internet to find uh, someone inside of Iraq that was uh, writing a weblog, and I got in touch with this man and, and basically asked him how to get in, and, and he kind of gave me a, a rough Lonely Planet guide, <laughs> handwritten how to get in to, to Iraq, and I followed his instructions, went to that hotel in Amman, hired a car there, went to a particular hotel in Baghdad, met some people there and, and, and started getting to work. And once I took that action, once I started taking action and following these, those instructions and going to Iraq, it, one thing after another just kept working out right at the right time to enable me to do the job that I had hoped to do, which was basically just to go in. Uh, I had enough money to stay eight, nine weeks and write about what I saw while I was there. And then I would come home and hopefully be able to sleep a little bit better at night. That was, that was my plan. I did not go with the goal of being a, of becoming a journalist. Um, but uh, life has its own scenario. Uh, and uh, this wasn't in the plans uh, in my head, but uh, clearly there were other designs. I want to read uh, some excerpts from the book, but I want to context them beforehand and then after I read them I want to give an update on on the situation uh, that each one of these is going to point towards uh, because I started seeing when I hit the ground in Iraq my very first trip which was at the very end of November 2003 I was smacked in the face by uh, horrible things going on and and huge disparities between what I was seeing right there when I hit the ground compared to how the occupation was being portrayed back home to you guys in the corporate media. And, and uh, one event I want to point to to start out with, it occurred in Samara, which is a city about 100 miles north of Baghdad. And it was November 29, 2003. And if you listen to the US military report on the event, the scenario went something like this. Uh, a U.S. military patrol was in downtown Samara. They were attacked by a huge contingent of Fedayeen. Fe the Fedayeen are basically Saddam Hussein's shock troops or his special forces. And so the military claimed and reported that they were attacked by this huge contingent of a, roughly 150 Fedayeen. They fought back valiantly, excuse me, and killed 48 Fedayeen. And then the next day, well, and, and first, that seemed a little odd because there were no organized Fedayeen after his regime was removed. We'd never heard anything like this before so far. And then what made the story even more stinky was the very next day the military said, no, it wasn't 48, it was 54. But they didn't give any reason as to why the number increased overnight. And of course, all of this, all of the military line was, was repeated verbatim by the corporate media. And so me and a couple of friends got an interpreter and decided to go up to Samar and check it out. And we got up there and we, we went to the, the hospital and talked with doctors and the mortician there who said there are eight bodies and they're all civilians. Uh, there were, were no fedayeen. Uh, yes, there was an attack on the Americans, but as usual, the people that launched the attack fled and then the Americans started shooting up the city. And here are the eight civilians. And then here are the wounded. You can talk to them if you want also, which we did. We went and interviewed one of the head sheikhs of the city and uh, head of one of the largest families in the city. And he told the same story, 
Where are the bodies? Show us the bodies. If, if you claim that there were 54 dead Fedayeen, show us one of them. And there were, there were none. Uh, we went then down to the uh, site of where the attack had taken place, right in downtown central Samara, and we stood with people there who uh, were, eye many of them were eyewitnesses themselves, and we were surrounded by buildings pockmarked by, by bullet, bullet gunfire and talk with people, and, and again, we were hearing all the same story that, yes, there was this patrol, it was attacked by two or three guys who then ran off, and then the soldiers went crazy and started shooting everything up. And interestingly, uh, what happened, one of the first things that happened to us there is we found that people were very, very angry uh, when, when we were standing there talking with people, we started, uh, being yelled at and people shaking their fists because what happened, we learned, was that many of the mainstream outlets had sent people up to cover the story at the time. And they came up and a few of them actually even did interview Iraqis, but they went back to Baghdad and instead of airing the quotes taken from Iraqis, all they did is then repeat the military side of the story. So it made things even more dangerous for those of us who were actually trying to work as journalists uh, and, and really do our job because any time I went somewhere, well, it was one of the rare occasions actually, that the mainstream media had actually reported on the story uh, and they had so misreported it that it had enraged the people there. So that's, uh, that's, where I, that's the context for what, this bit I'd like to read you. We were surrounded by throngs of nervous and very angry Samar residents when we revisited the scene of the attack after taking our tea. A rusty old taxi driving by slowed, and a man yelled at us out the window. All the media is not telling the truth. They are lying, all of them. Don't talk to them. I did so many in interviews with the media, and nobody is telling the truth. Nobody, journalists, has reported what I told them. Why should you even talk to them? They are lying all the time, so don't talk to them. I stood near a building riddled with bullets and spoke with people who crowded around, anxiously waiting to tell their story. Shell casings littered the ground near the wall of a home. A man in his early 40s exclaimed with his hands in the air, if the Americans can shoot every child walking in the street, it means the end of this planet. In just one week, I had already become familiar with the hands in air gesture made by frustrated and shocked Iraqis. To me, it signified the despair that was spreading across the country a plea to anything or anyone who would listen. Another man showed me a parked car scarred with 112 bullets. He told of a U.S. soldier who had gone crazy and fired his weapon everywhere, even up at the sky at electrical wires running above the street. Two of the wires had been shot through and were crudely spliced back together. They shot a lot of bullets to cut these wires, he said. The American soldier was laughing and shooting the wires. Are they Fedayeen wires? Were the wires attacking the Americans? He was laughing like a crazy man. Another man approached me with the two children of his brother killed by US gunfire by his side. This little boy and girl, their father was shot by the Americans. Who will take care of this family? Who will watch over these children? Who will feed them now? Who? Why did they kill my brother? What is the reason? Nobody told me. He was a truck driver. What is his crime? Why did they shoot him? They shot him with 150 bullets. Did they kill him just because they wanted to shoot a man? That's it? This is the reason? Why didn't anyone talk to me and tell me why they have killed my brother? Is killing people a normal thing now, happening every day? This is our future? This is the future that the United States promised Iraq? That was one week into my first trip. That policy of the U.S. military basically every, most times when a patrol was attacked and then the soldiers responding by shooting at anything that was near them. And uh, this is what I heard across Iraq over the next eight months that I would spend in Iraq over four different trips uh, at just about every single scene of an, an attack that I, I covered, whether it was an attack on a patrol or fighting in Fallujah or fighting in other cities, but across the board, uh, almost every single time, people reporting the same thing, that any time a patrol was attacked, uh, soldiers would respond by this massive ha ha haphazard shooting. 
And it's, it's for this reason that uh, we, we have such high statistics now of the, the real number of the dead in Iraq. And the, most, the only credible and scientific studies have been done by a team from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health and Iraqi doctors inside of Iraq working in concert. And both were published in the peer-reviewed British medical journal, The Lancet. And so they're referred to now commonly as The Lancet Report. The most recent of those was published in October 2006 and found that an estimated 655,000 Iraqis had died as a direct result of the invasion and occupation. That's 2.5 percent of the entire population of the country have been killed as a direct result of the U.S.-led invasion and occupation. The legwork, the groundwork for that study was actually done July a year ago. So it's very safe to assume that that number is not only higher, but notably higher. And there's actually a group now called Just Foreign Policy. Maybe some of you have seen the counters on the internet on various websites. But this group, basing it, their figures on the Lancet data, and then extrapolating from uh, media reports from the time that study was published to today, estimates that over 1,100,000 Iraqis have died because of the invasion and occupation. The next uh, excerpt I'd like to read concerns the first siege of Fallujah in April of 2004. And the context I want to give for this and for the siege overall, I want to really back up in history a little bit and, and give you some of this information. And you can compare this to uh, if maybe you were scanning the, the television to see maybe how the corporate media was reporting on this, um, think about how much of this information either you, you saw or, or didn't see reported in the mainstream. And first of all, we, we have to point out the fact that under Saddam Hussein, um, Fallujah was not a quote-unquote pro-Saddam city, as the corporate media told people. In fact, he struggled to control it and was consistently making deals with tribal leaders in the area uh, and basically had a, overall a hands-off policy towards Fallujah, despite the fact that a lot of his uh, military intelligence people live there. And uh, Fallujah, the, the tribal leaders and religious leaders of the city, when the U.S. invasion took place, uh, there was no fighting in Fallujah because the leaders said, look, uh, we're going to try to make this work. We're going to put our best foot forward. So when the Americans rolled into Fallujah, they were not attacked. Um, not to say they were greeted with rose petals and, and, and rice. They weren't, but they weren't attacked. And uh, things were relatively stable in Fallujah because while Baghdad fell into total chaos and looting, Fallujah, there was none of that, that basically tribal leaders were able to appoint teams uh, to take care of basic infrastructure jobs like garbage, keeping the water running, keeping the electricity going, um, running the police, this sort of thing. So Fallujah remained relatively stable, but problems arose less than a month after the fall of Baghdad, which was uh, April 9, was the fall of Baghdad. And before the very end of April, uh, there was a, a school in Fallujah that was being occupied by U.S. troops. Uh, they could put people on top, and they had a, a good vantage uh, from up there of the area. And what happened was there was a demonstration out in front of that school the day before classes were to start because people wanted to have it available for their children the next day to use. And uh, U.S. troops opened fire on the crowd and killed 17 people and wounded many others. And a Human Rights Watch report on the incident found that despite the military claiming that they had taken fire from the crowd, there was no shred of evidence to support that uh, there were, that, that ever happened. No shell casings were found. There were no bullet pock marks in the school whatsoever. Uh, but, but coming the other direction from the school out, behind the demonstration, the walls and the houses, et cetera, were riddled with bullets. Shortly after that, there was another demonstration uh, demonstrating against what happened there, and that too was fired upon, and, and several more people were killed. 
Thus, the resistance was born in Fallujah by, as a result of the actions of, of the military. And so Fallujah became more and more difficult to control for the U.S. military, and it was already at a point by March 2004 that uh, they really couldn't run patrols in the city anymore because every time they would run them, it would be 30 minutes or less before they would be attacked. And so every once in a while, they'd try to push a big armored column into the city. It would get hammered really heavily, and then it would withdraw. So they basically had already lost control of the city. But what set the stage for what happened on March 31 when the four Blackwater USA mercenaries were killed in the city? If you go back nine days to March 22nd uh, in Gaza, Sheikh Yassin, the spiritual leader of Hamas, was assassinated by the Israeli military. And that, of course, sent shockwaves across the Middle East, as events in the occupied territories always do. And so that set the stage. And then so when the four Blackwater USA mercenaries were going through Fallujah on March 31st, their small convoy was attacked. And the group that claimed responsibility for it and distributed pamphlets at the scene was called the Sheikh Yassin Revenge Brigades. And one of the trucks that was driving around pulling some of the body parts of the mercenaries had a poster of Sheikh Yassin in the back of it. As I said, pamphlets were distributed. So that is what then set the stage for the Siege of Fallujah. And after that event took place, the, one of the leading U.S. military commanders in charge of the area around Fallujah and Fallujah itself actually did not want to siege the city. He said, well, obviously this is a huge setback, but we do have some small reconstruction projects going. We're doing some water treatment and ir irrigation products. We're, we have a school going over here. So we're, they're little things, but we feel like if we keep taking this path, it's going to be more effective at building a little trust with people in the city. And, and I think we should keep going that direction. So it's important to note that the order to siege Fallujah didn't come from the military. It came from the White House. And so in this way, it's kind of a microcosm example repeated of the war itself, where if you remember back, before the invasion was even launched, we had high-ranking brass in the military saying, either no, don't invade Iraq at all, bad idea, or do it differently, either at a different time or with different troops. And again, rather than listening to the military commanders themselves, uh, the order to launch the invasion, of course, came from uh, the White House. So that essentially set the stage for the first siege of Fallujah. And uh, the siege broke out on April 4, 2004. That's when the city was sealed by the US military. And some friends of mine and I decided that uh, we, we would go into the city because there was a NGO in Baghdad that uh, was sending in a bus carrying humanitarian supplies to uh, one of the clinics in the city. And we decided that we, we had the opportunity to go in on that bus, and we decided to go. And we chose April 9th to go because the military had announced a ceasefire. And that was, of course, broadcast by the corporate media. There's a ceasefire. They're negotiating with uh, resistance in the city. And so I figured, well, it's, of course, going to be risky, but what better day to go in than a ceasefire? So we went in during the ceasefire, and I saw, we all saw with our own eyes as we were riding into the city on one of the back roads, F-16s dropping bombs in different parts of the city, helicopters strafing other parts of the city. And then as we really got into the, uh, the inner parts of Fallujah, uh, we could hear sporadic fighting all around us. And so that set the stage for uh, this next bit that I'd like to read you from my book. We rolled toward the one small clinic where we were to deliver our medical supplies. The small clinic was managed by Maki al Nazal, who was hired just four days ago. He was not a doctor. The other makeshift clinic in Fallujah was in a mechanic's garage. He had barely slept in the past week, nor had any of the doctors at the small clinic. 
Originally, the clinic had just three doctors, but since the U.S. military bombed one of the hospitals and were currently sniping at people as they attempted to enter or exit the main hospital, effectively, there were only these two small clinics treating the entire city of 350,000 people. The boxes of medical supplies we brought into the clinic were torn open immediately by the desperate doctors. A woman entered slapping her chest and face and wailing as her husband carried in the dying body of her little boy. Blood was trickling off one of his arms, which dangled out of his father's arms. Thus began my witnessing of an endless stream of women and children who had been shot by the U.S. soldiers and were now being raced into the dirty clinic, the cars speeding over the curb out front and weeping family members carrying in their wounded. One 18-year-old girl had been shot through the neck. She was making breathy, gurgling noises as the doctors frantically worked on her amid her muffled moaning. Flies dodged the working hands of doctors to return to the patches of her vomit that stained her black abaya. Her younger brother, a small child of 10 with a gunshot wound in his head from a marine sniper, his eyes glazed and staring into space, continually vomited as the doctors raced to save his life while family members cried behind me. The Americans cut our electricity days ago so we cannot vacuum the vomit from his throat, a furious doctor tells me. They were both loaded into an ambulance and rushed toward Baghdad, only to die en route. Another small child lay on a blood-spattered bed, also shot by a sniper. The boy's grandmother lay nearby, shot as she was attempting to carry children from their home and flee the city. She lay on a bed dying, still clutching a bloodied white surrender flag. Hundreds of families were trapped in their homes, terrorized by U.S. snipers shooting from rooftop, rooftops in the minarets of Moss whenever they saw someone move past a window. <coughs> Blood bags were being kept in a food refrigerator, warmed under running water before being given to patients. There were no anesthetics. The lights went out as the generator ran dry of fuel, so the doctors, who had been working for days on end, work by light provided by men holding up cigarette lighters or flashlights as the sun set. Needless to say, there was no air conditioning inside the steamy clinic. One victim of the U.S. military aggression after another was brought into the clinic, nearly all of them women and children, carried by weeping family members. Those who had not been hit by bombs from warplanes had been shot by U.S. snipers. The one functioning ambulance left at this clinic sat outside with bullet holes in the sides in a small group of shots right on the driver's side of the windshield. The driver, his head bandaged from being grazed by the bullet of a sniper, refused to go collect any more of the dead and wounded. Standing near the ambulance in frustration, Maki told us, they, U.S. soldiers, shot the ambulance and they shot the driver after they checked his car, inspected his car, and knew that he was carrying nothing. Then they shot him, and then they shot the ambulance, and now I have no ambulance to evacuate more than 20 wounded people. I don't know who is doing this and why he is doing this. This is terrible. This has never happened before, and I don't know who to call because it seems that nobody is listening. The stream of patients slowed to a sporadic influx as night fell. Maki sat with me as we shared cigarettes in a small office in the rear of the clinic. For all my life, I believed in American democracy, he told me with an exhausted voice. For 47 years, I had accepted the illusion of Europe and the United States being good for the world, the carriers of democracy and freedom. Now I see that it took me 47 years to wake up to the horrible truth. They are not here to bring anything like democracy or freedom. Now I see it has all been lies. The Americans don't give a damn about democracy or human rights. They are worse than even Saddam. I asked him if he minded if I quoted him with his name. What are they going to do to me that they haven't already done here, he said. According to doctors that I later interviewed in Fallujah in May after the siege ended, 736 civilians were killed and 60% of them at a minimum were women, children, and elderly. Later on, that same year, 2004, in November, the U.S. military launched what they called Operation Phantom Fury, uh, and it was, it was because, or it was under the guise of what the Bush administration claimed uh, was that uh, Jordanian terrorist Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was 
holding the city ransom. Uh, one military commander described it as a hostage intervention crisis, uh, the operation. The problem with that is that there's really no evidence uh, to support that Zarqawi ever stepped foot inside the city. And of course, uh, as I had seen with my own eyes, that uh, the vast majority of the people inside the city fighting were just Fallujians themselves trying to protect their city and their homes. Uh, but that November siege uh, destroyed approximately 70% of the city, and according to an Iraqi NGO in the city, uh, killed approximately 5,000 people, and again, most of them uh, not fighters. According to the U.S. military, there were 1,200 people killed in Fallujah, and they were all combatants. As as I was in Iraq, particularly that summer, uh, things were deteriorating so rapidly that it was really difficult to keep up with, with things. Um, because just before the attack on Fallujah was launched, um, as many of you might recall, the Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sadr had launched an intifada against the uh, U.S. military. And he did this in response to uh, several instig instigatory moves made by CPA head Paul Brimmer. Um, one of the last key moves Brimmer made was closing Sadr's newspaper, the Al Hausa. And Sadr had had enough uh, of that, coupled with many attacks fr from the U.S. military against his Mahdi Army militia, and had launched an uprising, an intifada. And so there was fighting all across the south of Iraq against the Brits, against the Americans and certainly around many parts of Baghdad. And th there was uh, evidence, there were uh, uh, Mahdi Army militiamen supporting the resistance in Fallujah. There were Fallujian resistance fighters supporting uh, the Mahdi Army down in Najaf then and at later times as well. So, uh, you know, in, in some ways it seemed like the different sects were going opposite directions, and then in other ways there was proof that they were coming together. And so it, would, it, it got quite confusing at times, and, and I would lose the plot. And uh, I, I couldn't keep up with what was going on and couldn't really make sense of what direction everything was going in. And so fortunately, uh, I had met a man, a senior political scientist from Baghdad University who, who uh, lived near one of my interpreters. And so every time I lost the plot, we would go talk to uh, this man to try to get back uh, put be, uh, back on track uh, to follow what was going on. And so that's the context of this next short bit that I'd like to read you. One day as we neared the end of April, Harb, my main interpreter, drove me to the other side of his neighborhood of Adamiya. The setting sun was bathing the nearby groves of date palms in a dark orange when we pulled in front of the old but elegant home of Dr. Wamid Omar Nathmi on the banks of the Tigris River, directly across from the sprawling green zone. We were escorted into his sitting room by one of his sons before Dr. Nathmi entered. The old stately professor greeted us formally, then immediately lit a cigarette and engaged Harb in some small talk in Arabic before getting to my questions. An outspoken critic of the former regime, Dr. Nathmi was truly a nationalist and had always worked for the Iraqi people rather than any particular sect or political party. It quickly became apparent to me that he had no qualms about criticizing U.S. policy. Quote, once you abide by the policy of the USA, you are not a terrorist anymore. In 1991, Syria was not a terrorist because they supported the war against Iraq. Syria opposed the recent invasion, so now they are a terrorist state, he explained. When I asked what he thought about the Bush administration's claim that Iraq was the front line of the, quote, war on terror, he replied, here one would have to distinguish between terrorism and resistance. Terror was unseen here before the invasion. In Fallujah, it is not terrorism, it is resistance. We spoke of U.S. policy throughout the Middle East. When I asked the professor about Palestine, he said, the crimes against humanity in Palestine are shown daily on the television. This does not indicate that the current U.S. administration is committed to democracy or human rights. How can the United States, a war criminal in Palestine, be accepted as a state builder in Iraq? We had a lengthy discussion on the reality in Iraq, 
where more and more Iraqis had long since woken up to the fact that the true U.S. agenda was not for the liberation or benefit, but for the oil and its own geostrategic military position. The Americans' war against Iraq is over, he told me. Now we have the war of Iraq against America. It is a war of Iraqis fighting for their country, their homes, their money, and their lives. Before I uh, go on to a question and answer session, um, I, and, and through experience from past presentations when I am used to giving a whole lot of very depressing information to people and, uh, and worry about them slitting their wrists as they walk out the doors, I've decided that I'll, I'll try to end on a little bit of a, an up note. Um, and also, it, it, it will lead into the question and answer session. Well, since generally one of the first two or three questions has to do with uh, what should we do or what can we do. This is a poem by author and poet Marge Piercy, and it's called The Low Road. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity in your own newsletter. Ten thousand, power in your own paper. A hundred thousand, your own media. Ten million, your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. Thank you. I, I, before I do start the question and answer session, I, I do want to, uh, a, a couple of things. One, I forgot to mention um, in my initial thank yous is I, I was very excited when I learned that I was going to get to come back to the Sanctuary of Independent Media. Um, I've given a lot of presentations in a lot of different places around the country, and I have never given one in an independent media center like this. Uh, this is incredibly uh, well put together. Uh, I just, uh, the, the, what I've seen of uh, just this, uh, this venue and the capabilities you have downstairs with the computers and the control room and the editing centers and uh, it's, a, it's a really vibrant, hopeful uh, uh, program that you have here and I'm, I'm really, really impressed and I wish we had one like this where I lived. Um, but I, it's, it's really inspiring, and uh, I, I tip my hat to you. You guys have a really, really good thing going here, and uh, I look forward to seeing it again sometime. Um, um, I want to address straight up before I get asked the question of what can we do. I want to give you a couple of things everyone can do when they walk out of here and go home tonight. Um, first, there's not any members of Iraq Veterans Against the War here tonight, are there? No? Okay, well the first thing that I'm going to suggest is go to the IVAW website, it's IVAW.org, and write them an email and say what can I do to help, 
that I'm sure they have a donation section, and I know for a fact that they need money. I just came from a presentation a couple of nights ago at a different drummer cafe up at uh, Fort Drum in Watertown, and uh, support IVAW. The next thing, a very, very close second, is Vets for Peace. Uh, John, where are you? John, uh, if you want to support Vets for Peace, uh, see John after uh, the, the question and answer session. Vets for Peace and IVAW are, uh, in my opinion, the, the spearhead of any movement that's going to end this dirty, filthy, illegal occupation uh, and stop the suffering of the Iraqi people and bring U.S. troops home where they belong. So see John after the question and answer session and uh, see uh, what you can do to help him. I know that they're about to run some really important ads for Veterans Day, and I know that he's uh, needing to fundraise for that, so uh, help him out. And uh, the, the third thing that I want to put out that the poem alluded to is organizing on a grassroots level as clearly this community does or you wouldn't be here. And with this center as a hub, um, it makes it very easy. But I can't stress the importance of organizing on a local level. Um, I go around all over uh, giving talks, and so many people feel like they're not doing anything that counts, and they wonder what they can do. And I think the problem is that everyone's looking at the big picture and waiting for someone to emerge to lead or or some big sign or something to be reported on the corporate media and what I, the message i want to leave you with that i actually feel hopeful about is that everywhere i go i see people doing really really amazing work this place is an example of that and and people involved in so many different issues doing so much great activism and work and the thing to remember is that the revolution is not going to be televised by the corporate media. Um, just like they won't report on the fact that they're in a self-described crisis of their own as they continue to tank their legitimacy every day. So my point is get, it, get involved, do the work, don't expect media coverage, but just keep doing the work anyway and organize locally. That right now at this point, this is absolutely the best thing that, that you can be doing. Uh, in addition to the first two things that I mentioned as well. Um, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions and answers. <coughs> oh, yeah, so if you have a question. Off, Darby, um, asking you about your recent experiences in Syria with refugees from Iraq. Yeah, thanks, Maureen. Um, I was in Syria about three months ago or so um, for a couple of weeks, in Lebanon for a couple of weeks. And the time in Syria was spent specifically covering the Iraqi refugee crisis. Today, one out of, one out of every five, excuse me, one out of every five Iraqis are now refugees. So on top of the heinous death count that I, I mentioned earlier, of over a million Iraqis, which are likely dead, uh, one out of five of the entire population of the country are, are refugees, either inside of Iraq or outside of Iraq. Um, when I was there uh, in, in, uh, in Syria, I interviewed the UNHCR regional information spokesperson, Sibylla Welks. And at that time, the UNHCR was reporting 1.2 million Iraqi refugees in Syria. And she admitted to me on the record that that was far, far too low. She said, I think the number is probably more like 1.5 million or even more, because we at the UN would have no way of knowing, because we don't even have enough personnel to have people on the border. Um, at that time, 50,000 Iraqis a month were coming over the border into Syria. And uh, so from that date to now, the, the crisis has, has worsened and the numbers increased dramatically. And I think that now in Syria, there's likely uh, 2 million Iraqis, or at least almost 2 million Iraqis in Syria alone, on top of another nearly million in Jordan alone. And then if we add in the numbers in Lebanon and other Gulf states, uh, the number then gets uh, even higher. And, and then internally within the country, the most conservative figures 
uh, recent figures are 2.5 million internally displaced people within Iraq, i.e. refugees. And again, I think the, the real number of that's much, much higher as well. Um, complicating things uh, are that, according to an Oxfam report that came out this last July, uh, on top of the refugees, another 4 million Iraqis are in dire need of emergency care, meaning they don't have drinkable water, they don't have enough food, they're living in absolute poverty, uh, and if they don't get that help very, very quickly, then they're at risk, uh, at risk for their lives. So when we add up all those numbers on top of the over a million dead, we're looking at just about half of the total population of Iraq, which was 27 million when the war was launched. Just about half of the population are either refugees in dire need of emergency assistance or dead. And this is all a direct result of the US-led invasion and occupation. Um, it, it's a, it, according to Refugees International NGO, it's the fastest growing refugee crisis on the planet. It's far bigger already than Darfur. So to give you an idea, and it's getting worse every day. And then the complicate things that up until se this past September, sept uh, um, Syria was the only country on the globe that had an open door policy for Iraqis. Jordan had already clamped down and imposed really severe restrictions and and uh, not allowing in men between the ages of 18 and 35, for example. And so Syria was the last place, but because Syria has been so overwhelmed with refugees, refugees are now over 10% of the entire population of the country. And so they've had to start clamping down, and now they're uh, mandating visas for Iraqis. And so now Iraqis that are trying to flee, most of them from death threats or because they've already been attacked or lost family members, uh, they, they can't. Uh, many of them are being turned back at the borders to go back home where many of them will face certain death. Next question. Can I just go from yes. This is actually kind of close to my height. Um, I guess I really wanted to ask you about this. There's a real widespread perception that citizen journalists or bloggers, you know, they don't know what the hell they're doing. They've never been trained. You know, if you have a situation where six different people witness a murder, they'll kind of tell you what happened in six different ways. And, you know, ostensibly journalists, I put that in finger quotes too, are supposed to be trained to learn techniques to be, uh, quote, objective and sort of get the story right. And I'm just curious, you know, how you and your community of citizen journalists deal with those issues, and I'm sure you do. But I'm just curious if, you know, how you respond to that question or that, how, that idea of, of getting the story right and not just relying on your own subjective impressions of a place and, you know, what's your strategy for dealing with that? Mm -hmm. Good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I didn't have any formal journalistic training before I went into Iraq. I did not go to journalism school. Uh, I have a BA from Texas A&M in speech communications. Uh, I've always loved to write, but I had done just only a little bit of freelancing w while I was living in Alaska before I went to Iraq. I, was, uh, I started out writing about mountaineering stories because I was working as a guide and ranger on Mount McKinley, rescue ranger uh, on Mount McKinley. And then after 9-11, we started to get a little bit political, so I did some book reviews, and we wrote a little bit of political stuff until they fired the editor of the paper where I was because we were upsetting the advertisers. Um, so that was one of my first big lessons in journalism. Um, but I went into Iraq, and I, I uh, basically tagged along with other foreign journalists and, and watched them and saw that it's not rocket science, that basically you need a pad and a pen and a recorder helps and then a computer and you go up to people and ask them uh, what happened and then you go talk with doctors and other anyone else you can find always always fact check always verify that it's not just one person telling the story and I, I learned pretty quickly that it's just not rocket science that uh, you basically the secret formula is Go to Iraq and go out and talk to the Iraqi people, step one. And step two, tell the truth. That's it. And uh, through talking with one of my colleagues, for example, Christian Parenti, who writes for The Nation and went through journalism school, he told me 
when we were together in Baghdad in the summer of 04, he said, actually, I think the fact that you didn't go to journalism school actually is, is, has benefited you greatly. He said, because you didn't have to deprogram yourself from the BS myth of objective journalism. Um, one of these things, objective journalism, which is accepted across the country as this is just how it is, alongside the myth that America is this benevolent superpower that only uses its military for good purposes and certainly never meddles in other countries' businesses. Um, it's, it's a myth. It's not true. There's, there's no, no truth to back it up whatsoever. The short version of the story is that the myth of objective journalism didn't start being taught in journalism schools until after corporations started buying up all the media in the 1930s. And so when you start cutting corners and you don't have enough different newspapers re representing different points of views, you have fewer journalists. And so now we all have to say, OK, well, we have to tell all the sides of the argument and lop off both edges of the argument and then have this thing called balance, which is uh, akin to uh, the, the idea, like right now, being used in public schools where there's a big push by fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, that, well, if you're going to teach evolution, you have to teach creationism be beside it because that's balance. So it's kind of the same idea with journalism, and it, it basically doesn't work, but it's what's become the norm. And um, I, you know, the funny thing is that uh, the stories and the facts speak for themselves. I, I would hold any of the stories up in this book for any scrutiny, and I stand behind all of it. And over time, I've been proven right. And the, the, the fact of the matter is, if you go out as a citizen journalist and really do your job and do a good job and are very thorough, then in time, you're proven right. And that's what happened, for example, with reporting white phosphorus being used in Fallujah. I reported this on Democracy Now! on November 2904 interviewing doctors and refugees coming out of the city. And I was scoffed at at the time. No one would touch this story. It was me, Al Jazeera, and like one other Arab media outlet that reported it. And I started to feel, you know, I definitely doubted myself over time. I was like, wow, this is, I don't get what's going on here. And then it wasn't until a year later that Rai TV in Italy ran a documentary about illegal weapons being used in Fallujah, and it reopened the debate. And then someone from the Independent in the UK newspaper called me and said, hey, you broke this story. We want to have you rewrite part of your story in a series of articles we're doing because we know the Pentagon's lying, because they were denying it, of course. And then that article went in a series of several that eventually ended up forcing the Pentagon to admit yeah, white phosphorus was used, and it probably did hit civilians. So, of course, the New York Times still never reported it, even after the Pentagon admitted it, even after they had someone write, one of their own writers write an editorial that was published in the paper condemning the Americans' use of white phosphorus, but they never reported it as a hard news story. So that's a long-winded way of saying that if you go out and do your job, and I highly, highly support and recommend anyone to go get active and do it. And now is the time, because the corporate media is in a self-described crisis. They're, they're dying, and they deserve to die. And I think we, we I think. <laughs> figuratively speaking, of course. But it's our job. We can help them die, but, but I think even more importantly, we can build the alternative in supporting independent media. And the best way to support independent media is to get involved in it yourself. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you.